Hello, good afternoon, folks, and welcome to uh, our music ministry piano seminar, Leading from the Piano. It is a great privilege to be together. I'm Phil Moore, and uh, I lead the music ministry, as well as the youth ministry, actually, at Cornerstone Church in Nottingham, and uh, actually where the guys have been streaming from this morning. Haven't we been served so well this morning by the music ministry team, by John T. Alcock, and uh, it's been a great blessing to, to fix our eyes on, on the, the real purpose of what we're doing when we meet together, when we gather together to sing and to praise God in that way. Um, I, uh, I lead the music ministry at, at the church. I'm also involved in, in various other music ministry training, uh, a bit of songwriting and other bits and pieces around the place and uh, so it, it, it's great to be together in this way. I'd also love to introduce my friend and also fellow Northern Irishman. It is a bit of a Northern Irish powerhouse this afternoon but there we go you know when we get together. David Gibson who's down in London. David uh, it'd be love to say say hello to you. Uh, let me bring you on to the call there. David uh, good to have you with us. Tell us a bit about yourself where you are. Hi guys, so I'm in, I'm in Cockfosters in North London. I'm the music minister here at Christchurch Cockfosters. Uh, has been for the last two years or so. Uh, but yes, as, as Phil says, I'm also from good old Northern Ireland. So yeah. It's great. You know, and it's really nice in, you know, in this kind of setting to be able to do this with somebody else. And uh, the way I've been describing this, people have been asking me, what's this seminar going to be like? What's going to be happening in it? You know, Phil, I really want to get some tips for how to be able to lead people better from the piano. And uh, the way that I've been describing it is I, I look like I know what I'm doing when I'm leading and playing the piano. David genuinely knows what he's doing uh this guy is yeah off the scale in terms of his skill and ability on the piano he's an arranger he's a conductor uh he's kind of classically trained but also somebody who's been able to navigate that tricky journey between uh leading uh leading in church but also in, in the classical world how, how do you bring some of those skills into what you're doing when you're playing in the church so david it's a great privilege to have you with us and i'm hoping i'm just going to be able to facilitate this time together and glean some wisdom and some tips and you know yeah i have a few things to say but david is going to teach me as we're going through as i hope he will each one of us thank you folks for um sharing in the chat keep the chat coming through that is our kind of level of interactivity today um on on the on the right hand side of your screen or below depending how it's set up you'll be able to see uh you can you can add a chat something into the chat there or you can indeed ask a, a question as well below. Later, it, it would be great to have some time to ask questions uh, and, uh, and do that as well. Um, there's one or two questions coming through as, as we begin this time as well. But as we start, let me pray and commit our afternoon, this session, to the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much that we can come uh, and devote time today or for others later on catch up who will come and, and, and hear this time. Lord, that we can commit time to pausing and thinking about you, no matter what our year has been like, no matter we, if we feel that we're kind of um, running on empty because actually lockdown's been hard, uh, the musical commitment to our church have been, have been intense. Oh Lord, for, for all of us who, who maybe feel on the other hand that, that, that we haven't been able to use our gifts for you in the way we would have liked to, Lord, we pray that, that you would come and meet us where we're at, wherever we are in terms of our skill and experience, whether we, uh, we feel quite, um, quite confident as we play or whether we feel actually quite nervous about when we play in church. Lord, we pray that this would be a, a helpful time for each one of us. Lord, we commit it to you. We pray that you would um, use it to magnify Christ for your glory. Amen. Well, I appreciate as we begin, everyone's going to be in a slightly different situation. Some of you guys will uh, be meeting physically. Maybe you've been meeting physically as a church for some time. Others of us um, will be entirely online at the minute and will have been for some time. And so I appreciate that some of these things that we talk about will, will be transferable to different situations. Uh, so that's why the chat's important. If there's things that are particularly on your heart that you're itching to hear about and talk about, do keep those coming in uh, so that we can really direct this and focus this uh, as best we can to, to you. And we want to serve you and your church as well. Uh, your experience of church this last Sunday, maybe you have uh, 20 people in the building at the minute. Maybe, uh, you know, you're really frustrated by the fact that we can't even sing. Maybe you are the only piano player in your church. And, and when people are off, when you're off sick or away in normal times, 
actually your church really has to go a cappella or, or things are a bit more tricky. Maybe uh, you're in a situation where your PA guy has been away. You're running with no microphones. The, the technology has been really frustrating you. Um, you know, I, I appreciate as we start, we're, we're still in different places. You know, musicians, you know, we do get sick. People move away. People burn out. And so as, as we start this time together, I, I want to just remind us that, and encourage us to remember the main thing. Uh, you know, as I was taught, I'm sure a lot of us who've grown up through UCCF and other organizations as a student, remember to keep the main thing the main thing. And I've, I've really held on to that from my student days. And uh, Romans 1, 16, of course, says that I am not ashamed of the gospel. Paul writes, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. The gospel, not music, not our piano playing ability, the gospel is the power of God. When our musicians, our instruments, our technology, our live streams, our audio, when that's not impressive, when the PA feedback in the room pierces right through you, we can wonder why would people even come to our church? Why would people even log on to our live stream? Well, we must remember they come because we have something to offer that the world doesn't, the world could never offer. The amazing news that Jesus Christ um, has come into this world to live that perfect life, to die in the place of lost rebellious sinners like us, to reconcile us to God. And so our music, our piano playing ability, no matter how great that is, it can never raise a dead soul to life. But the good news about Jesus can and does. Uh, you know, we, we may never come musically close to what the church down the road is doing and uh, what other people maybe in our church family are able to do, what people are listening to on their iPhones. And I just want to, at the beginning of this time together, say that's okay. You know, we're not comparing ourselves to what we see on YouTube. Uh, it's it's never been easier than it is now, hasn't it, to actually compare ourselves to what other churches are doing and think, oh, we're not quite, we're not quite doing that as well as we could. We want this time to be helpful to sharpen us in our abilities and and practically, and we're going to spend 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 plenty of time thinking about practical examples. But we want want to start this time by saying. It's the gospel, not our music, that is the power of God. So no matter how out of tune your piano is, no matter how out of time your drummer is, no matter how underwhelming you might feel your musical ability is, the gospel is still the power of God. So that's where we want to start. Um, I've asked this question. I want this to be a helpful time in both learning and sharing from the experiences of one another, as, as you have been doing already in the chat. Um, some people have been doing that, the joys and the trials. And so I've asked you to share maybe what are the different challenges that you might face in your music ministry in your church? If you can, just have a wee look down in the chat even now. Um, I don't know if the chat's going to be up afterwards in, in catch up. Possibly will, possibly won't. But uh, you might be able to engage with some of these Things. Let me read one or two of the things like the people are saying. Um, uh, Josh has said it's hard to communicate with the rest of the musicians, especially if you're trying to play and sing well. Absolutely, there's so much to think about, isn't it? You know, it can be uh, it can be just a bit stressful even sometimes as you as you play because you feel like there's so many plates to spin, and occasionally one of those plates comes crashing down to the ground, doesn't it? Um, I don't know, uh, David, as you look at the chat, is there anything else that's, that's jumped out to you that people have said? Um, it'd be worth having a wee look through. Uh, um, well, I, I can't see the chat. So. <laughs> <laughs> David uh, can't see the chat. That's okay. I, 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 I will, just got to on you for the chat, Phil. <laughs> I will relay. As David I, completely, speak, I completely relate to that spinning plates thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's great. As, as David's chatting later on, I'm going to go through these and, and, and see some of the things that particularly stand out. Um, somebody said here, uh, Rosie said, I re relocated three years ago, now in a very small church. There are two of us who play the piano and no other instruments. That's the biggest challenge for me. I'm not a natural upfront person. I miss playing in a music group. However, on the other side, the mostly older members of a church are pretty <coughs> up for learning new things. How wonderful is that? 
as well as singing um, the old, maybe the old hymns. Uh, that's brilliant to hear that you know people of different generations. One of my favorite little anecdotes about about that in church is I remember starting up this kind of prayer and praise time where we had, um, you know, we thought we're going to do an afternoon service and we're going to have uh, kind of modern songs and things like that. And and some of the elderly folk came along and I thought, well, this is. This might be a little bit loud for them. They might might not be quite what they're expecting. And uh, one of the ladies who was in her mid nineties at the time, she said, "Oh, Philip, we just loved that. We thought it was wonderful. It was a little bit loud, but you know what? We'll sit closer to the back." And I thought that was so <laughs> gracious as that. You know, you just think, you know, not Excellent. just turn it off, which is great. Yeah. Uh, anyway, th- those different challenges there. I just want as, at the beginning of this time together. There's various challenges that people uh, will say. Keep them coming in if there's other things that you're saying. That's uh, one of the biggest challenges. This is from Joe. I find is portability. Can't just pick up a keyboard like you do an acoustic guitar. If someone wants to lead a worship song in a spontaneous setting, absolutely. So maybe in a home group or in a youth group or in a children's group. Also think about um, setting up location, kind of plug in somewhere. There's lots to think about, isn't there? The kind of practicalities of what you're doing. Uh, lots of people saying there's a lot of things to think about. Um, uh, yeah, somebody here, uh, George and Hannah, songs that have been chosen by someone else that are difficult to play and sing at the same time. Any ways of making this easier when prep is time is limited. Absolutely. We'll talk about that a bit later on as well. Uh, music theory, somebody's talked about there. That could be a challenge. Um, eye contact with the congregation. Um, you know, obviously one of the biggest challenges at the minute is that if you're singing in front of people and leading people in that situation, you're often the only person who's singing in the room or maybe one or two people as the guidance allows. Um, somebody else saying... Really? I off- I some- Go ahead, There's David. a barrier of the piano in front of you. If you've got a piano like this in front of you, you can't see over it. So how That's do you position it. the piano so that you can sort of have com- contact with the congregation as well, yeah? That's and tricky. actually now, you know, in a lot of our churches, we've got perspex screens in front of us, you know, when we're playing yeah. and leading at the minute. And, you know, I, 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 I certainly feel like I'm a, I feel I, I can identify with what it's like to be a goldfish at the minute. You know, you're inside a bowl <laughs> and you've got this plastic in front of you and you think there's another physical barrier sometimes yeah. between you and the other musicians. And these things actually are, are, are obviously needed at the minute and during COVID times, but... Uh, it, it's an it's another challenge, isn't it? And we've got to kind of work out how do we overcome these things, and as the as the guidance uh, continues and uh, understanding that. But those challenges, I think, can fit into. We've kind of got five categories where we think some of these challenges fit into. The first one is people. The challenge of people. Maybe you don't have enough musicians. You feel like you're the only person. You're kind of running on empty. Maybe a bit burned out by the situation. Um, a second challenge might be leadership. And so an example of that might be that the person choosing the songs is maybe not a, a very musical person or maybe is uh, can be a bit of a barrier. For instance, you know, you get the songs last minute on a Saturday evening. I know I'm sometimes guilty of sending out songs a bit late to the musicians. And, and so you don't feel like you've got time to practice and get ready for Sunday. Uh, so people and leadership and the third thing we thought about was, was skill you know so people are talking about how can we grow and develop our skill as a musician and David particularly is going to help us with that in the first section of our time this morning or this afternoon uh, engagement that was that was the other thing you know somebody else has said the kind of eye contact with the congregation is a challenge um, you know, somebody says my eyes need to be on the, the music or the keyboard and so I don't feel connected to the congregation uh, engagement and sometimes if you do lift your head and you look out our congregations dare I say it aren't always the most encouraging place to look are they you know it doesn't Very always inspiring. feel <laughs> it doesn't always feel like everyone is engaging and uh, you know people we're British so you know that we we have a, an emotional kind of uh, range which is different from the person beside us and sometimes that's smaller than, than maybe we would like it to be. Um, but yeah, engagement. And sometimes you don't know whether if something has gone well because nobody's told you. You've not had a kind of feedback time or feedback culture in your church um, in a good way. Good kind of feedback, not the negative kind of feedback in a PA. <laughs> uh, uh, so that's engagement. And also then ultimately our hearts. You know, where is our heart at on a Sunday? What has been... 
uh, what's the Lord been doing to to challenge us, to maybe sharpen us, to sand down some of those rough corners where uh, we might have ungodly, unhelpful thoughts about um, those in our church or our leadership or other musicians or or whatever it might be. Um, our hearts need to be um, transformed. And we'll pray that that God would do a work in our hearts today as we come to his word and come to him in in the worship of God as well. Uh, what we're going to do now is, I, I just thought it'd be helpful as we so you can get to know us a little bit. Uh, I was going to ask David just to share a little bit about um, your musical journey. Tell us about how you came to play in church and, and how, yeah, I guess your experience of that briefly uh, up until now. Sure, yeah. So I, I grew up going to church in Northern Ireland. Uh, parents brought me to church. Um, I also grew up playing the piano. Uh, so whenever I was telling my mother about doing this seminar, I was like, oh, I, I don't know really. How, I'm struggling with the idea of helping other people um, play the piano in church. And my mum said, yeah, you, David, you've been doing it since you were about four. I mean, she says she remembers me uh, playing the piano in the living room and uh, playing a melody and then next thing was these chords came in um, so from a young age I was I was really really taken with the piano I couldn't get away from the thing and uh, I suppose I started playing piano in church probably around the age of uh, 11 12 um, got the opportunity to to cut my teeth in that around then um, and and since then I've never really stopped um, I suppose towards the end of my teenage years I started to take classical playing a lot more seriously that's when I um, started wanted to go to music college and then I got the opportunity to study at the Royal Northern College of Music in Manchester for four years where I did classical piano playing um, but I, I, throughout all that time I never stopped playing in church um, always growing uh, in that skill because um, it is very different um, and then once I graduated I yeah I worked as a, as a pianist and a, an arranger and basically doing anything musical that people would pay me to do um, but that, that's, that's pretty much my experience. I, I was very lucky. I got to start playing at church very young. Um, and uh, I just happened to be in a church where that was, that was fine and there was space for me to do that. Uh, I do feel very blessed by that. What yeah, about you, Phil? Tell us that's a bit about great. your journey. Yeah, no, absolutely. Very similar, actually, in some ways, David. Yeah, I, I was given an opportunity to play almost, almost worryingly young <laughs> to play in yeah. church i think i was i Definitely was playing not ready <laughs> yeah, yeah on on a number of different levels i wasn't yeah. ready but I, I think uh, uh it was it was great that there were people who saw i guess some potential and um mm. i'm thankful for that i remember the first sunday playing in church i, I think probably a 10 year old something like that uh they, they kind of ruled me out for the children's song and um uh, uh, I think I can't even remember what it was. Jesus love is very wonderful, or something like that. Uh, probably something terrible, <laughs> like if I was a butterfly. I don't know. Uh, no, 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 no offense. Uh, no offense if you love that song. If that is your song, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, anyway, I remember it just went horribly wrong. Like I think I played a bunch of wrong notes. I got really stressed out by the whole thing, and I went down and sat beside my mum in church and said, "Mum, I am never." ever doing that ever again as you do as a kind of 10 year old and uh you know i often get reminded of that story by others who know it and say well you know it's uh you know god's got a sense of humor when he, he kind of uses some of us when we feel like you know we put ourselves out there but yeah so i, I started quite young i kind of grew up in this kind of transitional period between what would have been the the organ and the piano and uh you know if you were really going for it as a church the way to do it, you would have the organ and the piano at the same time. And uh, that uh, <laughs> that was like... So that, that's stuff. not a thing anymore. I, I don't know whether it is a thing very much anymore. It's maybe in some Northern Irish churches it might well be. Maybe still, um, yeah. But there was definitely a bit of a turning point. You know, the, 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 the musical instruments began to kind of appear as my became a teenager you had a, the guitar was added in the bass guitar and then the the most dreaded of all the drum kit and came into the church and you know some people struggle with that and yeah I, I was really thankful because it was a really interesting time to kind of grow up um hearing like the modern hymn coming in you know I remember hearing in Christ alone for the first time and thinking wow this uh well yeah I, I, if I'm honest my first reaction was it'll never catch on 
<laughs> and again, how wrong I was. And you know what a what a fantastic song which has served the church so well. But but hearing these kind of the modern hymn evolve and actually the piano becoming not just a kind of side instrument in even in the mu- the worship band setting, but uh, as I think a lot of our uh, churches will find either our music is kind of guitar driven or piano driven generally when we're leading mm-hmm. and um uh, uh, the majority of uh, maybe possibly as, as i can see the chat coming in some people saying you know it feels like um you know i'm the pianist and i've got to tell the guitarist and the drummer and the bass guitarist what to do and you know, that's above my pay grade that's not i've not been uh, not been trained in that way and uh, maybe we can spend some time thinking about that as well David, I'm going to stop talking briefly for a minute and, and I'm going to hand over to you and then we'll, we'll chip in. It's very relaxed time, by the way. I will keep an eye on the chat. As, do make comments as people are going mm. and uh, and I'll try and pick those up as we can. And uh, yeah, if, if you feel like it's been missed or dropped down the pile, just say it again and uh, I'll, I'll try and pick it up yeah. as we go. Thanks, David Phil. is going to, yeah, go for it. Thanks so much. Um, I'm just going to take us through some of the technicalities of, of actually playing the piano in church. Um, and I'm interested to start. Maybe Phil, you could you could look in the chat. Could you could you let us know whether you're a self-taught pianist or a classically trained pianist, or um, what 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 is sort of going on there? What what's your background in terms of piano? Uh, really interested to know. Um, but I want to I want to maybe say that whenever we come to playing piano in church, we do want to almost be the best of both. Uh, so we want the sort of knowledge and, and basis, technical basis of the classical playing, but we also want the freedom that comes from being self-taught. Because um, uh, I think quite often as classical pianists, we are very much constrained by uh, what notes are in front of us. And I want to I wanna try and help us see beyond that. Um, so that's some of the things that I'm going to be doing. Um, so when it comes to piano playing, I think there's three main things that uh, sort of define piano playing in church, melody, rhythm, harmony, um, those three main things. We're going to focus mainly on rhythm and harmony uh, in this time together. Um, I'll say a little bit about melody later on. Um, but firstly, um, Phil's, Phil's kindly reminded us at the start, like the main thing uh, is the gospel and we are gospel driven in all that we do and we want our playing to be glorifying to God. Um, but I want to say firstly, practice. I'm sure a lot of you are just going to go, oh no. Um, but Practice for excellence. Excellence is, is good. Excellence that deepens and strengthens the faith um, of our churches. Because um, I, I, I do think quite often as musicians, uh, we content ourselves with something that, oh, that, that'll do, that'll do. Let's, let's, just, let's just do that, that'll get by. Um, and I want to encourage us that biblically, actually, skill and excellence is there. Psalm 33 verse 3 says, um, sing to him a new song, play skillfully and shout for joy. And, and Kenaniah in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 um, was in charge of the singing in uh, amongst the Israelites because he was skillful at it. Um, so uh, skillful is skillfulness is something that we should strive for uh, and being excellent at. And it's skillful is particularly to develop and deepen the faith of our church. The more skillful we are, the more we will be able to serve our church better and the more the less distracted they may may, may, may be about us and 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 whatnot now the flip side of that is obviously we're not just seeking for sophistication we don't want to overcomplicate things um, we may not want to use every single ounce of skill that we have every time we play uh, probably is not the best idea um, but we do want our playing to be pointing to god and so i think we must practice we should be practicing um, if we're playing regularly in church, we want to be practicing regularly to, to play in church. Um, uh, practice is, is so much. I don't know if you've heard of the 10,000 hour uh, rule where they say if you practice anything for 10,000 hours, um, that you'll pretty much be at a professional standard. Um, obviously, that goes alongside talent and gift and passion. Um, but we can all be better if we practice right. Um, so how do we practice? I want to say that just simply playing a song through is not practicing. Um, I want to encourage us to think that actually practice is getting to the nitty gritty of the little details and repeating those over and over again. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of uh, a famous pianist called Lang Lang. He's a Chinese classical pianist. His technical ability on the piano is just phenomenal. 
and he he um uh, I've watched a video of him showing us how he practices a C major scale and and it's fascinating because it starts so slowly he starts basically like this where every note down two octaves and then he goes slightly faster only slightly faster this is a really painful process to go through and then he goes to that again and eventually we've sort of had the speed David, you, you're just showing off now, really, aren't you? Uh, yeah. No, is, I want to show. I want to show that that you know the, the the fast playing can only happen if you've done the slow playing, um, and 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 that that's true. That that's that's what um, professional. You might look at a professional musician and go, "Oh, how do they do that?" It is just slow practice and dedicated um, time to that. So repetition, 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 um, practicing it until um, you don't. You, you're really confident with something. Um, and it requires thinking about what you're playing, um, recognizing the, the, the struggles that you have, identifying the problems and then solving those problems. So it is um, a, quite an involved exercise and it is hard work. It's not always fun, uh, but it is immensely rewarding. It'll be immensely rewarding for us to sit and practice for an hour and, and to see the fruit of it at the end. And it'll be immensely rewarding for our church as well as each week uh, we come back having practiced and being that bit more confident and better able to to lead from the piano. So don't just play through songs, don't play songs at all, even if you've only got 10 minutes, take one thing and practice it 10 times rather than playing a song through twice. That will be far more valuable than simply just playing through. So that's the first thing, practice. Um, so. Uh, I want to talk a bit about rhythm and groove uh, as we sort of get into the nitty gritty of things. Um, so rhythm, groove, um, in one sense the, the metronome beat is just a tick, that's obviously just your, your tempo. Um, but the groove is, is more of a feeling, isn't it? It's, it's an inner pulse. It happens from inside us. Um, so the groove is what we feel um, that then comes through our arms and in our hands and into our playing. Um, so this is that's just a, that's just a beat, but give it a bit of a, a groove and a feel, and it, it's transformed how it sounds. Um, uh, so uh, it's not just the notes; it's how we play the notes. It's the feeling behind them. It's the rhythmical framework which everything else hangs on, and and everything has as a groove of some sort, even if it is um, quite a classical. Yeah, there has to be some sort of rhythm there that isn't just you playing the notes. So the groove is really, really important. That's helpful, David, because I think often we think the word groove and we think kind of jazzy. And it's it's not necessarily just that, is it? It's you know, as you say, praise the Lord, my the, the, praise my soul, the King of Heaven has got a mm. groove to it, and an old hymn, you know, everything. It's it's just it's the feeling behind yeah. the notes. It's it's yes. how it feels, and that that it, it sits on this rhythm um, that just makes it flow um, yeah. and makes it sound natural. Um, so it's really really important. Um, it usually results in like quite sparse chords. Um, uh, and and a, a common thing to do in, in piano playing is to almost imitate the guitar rhythm. So that might be some sort of guitar. You, know, you do that in the right hand. Just play the bass in the left hand. And you sort of got That's, a bit of a beat. Um, you got a bit of a, it's almost like a don't stop believing you're going for there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I feel like you're transported <laughs> to know, the 80s. I don't know where that came from. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, but also like arpeggiation can be groove. So that, that arpeggiation that's filling in um, the beats, it, it gives it that flow, that same sort of rhythmical uh, feeling behind it. Um, but sometimes also there may not be groove to the notes that we play. Uh, we might just want to play a block chord. But 
it's what happens inside us as we're playing those block chords, which is the groove. So I've still got my beat. I'm still going. There is a groove there. Um, that's a really good place to start. If you're not used to playing um, in, a, in, a, in a style with a groove, in a band as such, just playing the chords and feeling what happens in between those chords is the best place to start. Um, so maybe this Sunday, if you have a few other people, if you've got a guitarist who can strum throughout, see so you know if they can do that bit. You don't need to, you just play the chord and let them fill in the rhythm. Um, if you've got a drummer, um, the, the bass, the kick drum and the snare drum are the two things which you're listening for, for the groove. Um, again, the groove has to be there, but we don't necessarily want to play all the notes all the time to make the groove because you might have other things going on around you. And I think that's important, David, isn't it? Because the, one of the aspects of, of the groove, and maybe that's a new term for folks who are, who are watching now, um, it, it's almost about engaging with the music and the kind of rhythm behind the music, but also if you have other musicians in your setting, and I know some people will and some people won't, it's being aware of what other people are doing and also trying to lock that together as a kind of cohesive thing. Mm. So it's yeah. not a competition. It's not like the piano versus the guitar versus the drum kit, who can play the most notes the best mm. and the quickest scale up and down the piano. It's about how can this groove lock in and and that's yeah. what take, yeah, yeah. so not just practice on your own, practice mm. where possible with others and getting with that others. experience always, too. Always, always, yeah, yeah. And and dynamics are really important in this as well. You know, in, instead of just playing every note the same, You've got to be aware dynamically what are the most important beats in the bar. So on a 4-4 four, four bar, which, which most songs are, it's, it's generally beat 1 is the most important, beat 4 is the second most important, beats 2 and 3 barely want to be there. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, 3, 4. If you can think that 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, then that really helps the feeling. We don't just want to play every, every chord the same. Um, that's when it begins to, just to sound a bit more metronomic than groovy. Um, some of us will need to learn how to play quieter in that regard. Some of us may also need to learn how to play a bit louder, a bit, a bit more solidly. So that there's a good sound there which can resonate. The piano is very, very natural at, at resonating. Um, uh, but sometimes we don't always give it enough um, depth in the key to resonate. So some of us may need to learn how to play louder. And also, if we're thinking about the groove, it helps avoid the wandering fingers that go up and down the piano, you know? And, you know, as you do that, you can probably hear that actually all the rhythm has sort of gone out the window with that. Um, uh, because I'm too focused on the notes that I'm playing I've forgotten to think about the rhythm. Um, I, I want to say we don't need all that um, up and down the piano. What, what we need when we're, we're accompanying singing in church is just a solid rhythmical bass, which is really... I, I, I love that. That's great. And, like, David, you are so good. And it, it's almost the thing is, you know, it, just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should do it. Exactly, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I think that's one you of know, the, and, the challenges, the more, isn't it? It's, it, it, you know, um, classical trained pianist, it, I, I've fallen into this trap so many times of playing way too many notes, especially at the top end, and, and people must just think I'm trying to play Rachmaninoff or Chopin, you know, and, and I'm not, it, it, but I need to, I, and I'm still learning um, how to hold back my playing, just to think, what, what is needed here to accompany the singing, rather than what do I want to play that is potentially self-seeking and self-serving. Um, yeah, so I, I, I'll give a few examples of, of playing with a groove. Um, Cronin with many crowns, a modern hymn. You can play classically, obviously. But you don't have to. If you've got a band, that's actually quite difficult to get the guitarist to fit into that and the drummer to fit into that. So you wanna, you wanna create space for them if you've potentially got a band. But also, I think, um, it can be it can be ha more helpful to sing if you've got more of a rhythmical groove. So I tend to think that different verses can have a different groove as well. So verse one of Crowning with Many Crowns, I just do the normal chords. Crowning with many crowns, the lamb upon the throne. Hark how the heavenly Keep that going. 
one through. Verse two then, I'll do something similar, but I might just relax it that bit more and, and allow myself to fill in a bit more. So, crown it with many crowns, that bit of musical development from from verse one to verse two um first yeah phil's coming back that's great yeah there's just a couple of questions come in just specifically on this kind of point which i think it might be helpful just to put, put in at this point um so mm. uh, uh caroline just said i agree that less is more not playing all the notes is important especially on the piano however when i'm leading i do find i play more to fill out the sounds as i'm trying to lead the other band members as well as leading the song do you find that you play mm. more notes when leading versus when you are kind of playing the piano in the background? Um, I definitely think there's one. a temptation to, yeah, there's definitely the temptation to play more notes. Um, I wonder whether, it, you know, we they need it quite as much as we think they do. Yeah. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes they do need a really clear... Stay with me, guys, you know? <laughs> Um, uh, yeah. but, but sometimes actually they, they don't and quite often they don't. And, and I think yeah. potentially sometimes, you develop, yeah, right. you develop a culture then of being over-reliant on, yeah. on what you're giving them. And you want to, you want to teach and equip your musicians to all fill the space that their instrument will fill. You can feel like you are, you're kind of driving it. Yeah. And we do a lot of that and that's got its place to kind of you can feel like yeah. you as the lead piano, pianist is the kind of accelerator pedal for your mm -hmm. band but actually if, if you have got used to playing together and you've like locked into that you can create um shape as 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 a group rather than kind of having to drive that as an individual so in terms of adding depth or even volume and kind of bringing things yeah. back that that's mm -hmm. not that's not all on us as the the pianist and it's trying to, to make sure that we kind of see our place. Somebody yeah. else has said, I thought this was helpful just there. What what about if you keep the beat in the left hand? Would you get an example of that? Is it yeah. is a little flowery playing at at appropriate at moments? Can that enhance things? You know, so yeah, is, I, it, is it okay to I'll be go flowery? on to talk a bit a bit more about fills and, and riffs a bit later on, um, right. where, where we'll talk about that. Um, uh, the term flurry, I'm not too sure about. Uh, you know, it, it may just be a moment of decorating, a moment to fill yeah. the sound, but it can be something really simple, like like two notes, which fills the sound. But yeah, definitely allowing, allowing your left hand thumb to almost be your metronome, if, if that's helpful. So another example would be blessed to be your name. But my left hand's just sort of ticking away. And you've got that, you've got that tick in the left hand, but it's still got a rhythmical feel, and your right hand is doing something that's more in tune with the groove. Well, David, you you will have made someone's afternoon because somebody has specifically asked the question: Can you tell us how to play the piano to "Blessed Be Your Name"? Aye. There you go. You've done it. You've done it. You smashed yeah. it. Well, I mean, okay. there's no right or wrong answer to it. Um, uh, but I say it's a song that we're doing tomorrow night at my church. So I've been thinking this week about how, how to play it because it's not, it's actually something that I haven't done in a long time. Um, and I, I, I just sort of come up with this, this idea, this groove. And I'll keep that going the whole way through. So halfway through the verse, every blessing you Get to the chorus, you can then move it up, but it stays the same. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. You know, I haven't really changed the groove, I've just sort of slowly worked up from here to here to here, um, yeah. with each time it builds, and I'm never getting you, in the way. Yeah. You've gone for the crotchets, yeah. so what key are yeah. you? That's, yeah, that's right, yeah. B flat. All right, oh, controversial. <laughs> Sorry. It's A or B, isn't it? That song. Come on. Uh, yeah, so you've kind of gone for a more of a crotchet thing. 
rather yeah. than going for the because the, the guitar everyone you know i i remember looking at this song thinking that is a guitar song because the guitars mm. go ching, 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 yeah. ching, ching. they do that kind of quaver thing that, and they can't do that that would work alongside that um, exactly exactly yeah. we don't have to feel like we've got to do what the guitar is doing in order to make it work you know we can't mm. as you say you can have your little riff very simple thing going along even just playing your your crotchets or whatever it might be you know yeah. very very simple it, it doesn't have to be um you know it, it's almost relearning especially if we are classically trained it's it's relearning to play more simply and it's not necessarily mm-hmm. playing less notes it's just locking in as you said earlier on to the groove it's all about that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um another example uh with a different type of song oh lord my rock and my redeemer where you've got Doing arpeggios. It's a very soft groove. I right, so three, four. You know, but with that, the left hand filling that in. Yeah, you, that is still a groove. Similarly, with um, the song "Holy, Holy, Holy." soft groove but there's still that groove there it's still a very soft spare almost spared back type of playing yeah Um, that's really beautiful i really like what you did there it's lovely yeah somebody's asked a question how do you keep even a simple riff or groove going while you sing you know is that just something that you get better with with practice and like i'd probably say on that one um oh Almost when you're playing while you sing, and we'll talk about this later on, but that that needs to become almost like an automatic thing that you do, and that probably does come with practice. You know, it's like driving the car. Mm. You know, you you get used to it being. You know, you, you don't think about putting your foot on the clutch if you've got a manual car, or you know, all the time when you're driving. You you, you just kind of do it. It becomes intuitive, and yeah. it's trying to de- develop that intuition into you know how do you how do you play in a in a simple enough well, way within your ability that you can you can comfortably do it yeah that's, and that, that's the key because uh, it is simplicity we're not we're not looking for really complex grooves or or really um sort of out there rhythms which would be virtually impossible to sing along to if we were also playing them um it is just a you know a, f- a very soft feeling My piano playing is is there just to serve the singing. Um, uh, I'm not sort of thinking I must play every note. It's then becomes I'm just sort of letting the space, uh, creating the space with the sound of the piano to then sing on top of. Um, which I, I I mean personally I find that that really helpful. Um, Another thing is is riffs and ostinato, which is which is linked to to rhythm. So an ostinato is basically a continuously repeated musical idea um, throughout the whole song. These are really common in uh, contemporary Christian songs nowadays. We get them all the time, and they're really really simple, and they're actually um, relatively simple to play, and therefore hopefully relatively simple to sing on top of. Um, So basically we take an idea, a a very small, simple musical idea, give it its sort of groove and rhythmical feel um, and we employ it throughout the whole song. So it's not a technical exercise, so say for example, I could play that like a technical exercise or I could play it like an ostinato, where it's got some dynamic alterations, also employ the pedal. This is a song called Build My Life. This goes Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring And just keep that going. And then whenever we get to the chorus, keep it down, but I might move it down the octave. Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up, and I get it just keeps going and then we go back, we do the, the second verse again. You know, I'm now lowering the piano, so I've got a bit more 
depth to the side. <laughs> that just sort of grows it's it's you've got to you, you might have to work a little bit at, at working out how to give the song its shape but eventually you land at a point where it gets big <laughs> the, the ostinato is still in there it's continued the whole way through but I've used it to provide this shape. And then at the end, you would just sort of play it out. Let it slowly fade. Take a few notes out. Let it ring. And then you're done. And you've given this the song a big arc, which is which is so lovely and, and satisfying and, and really great to sing along to as well. Yeah, that's so good, David. Uh, somebody might look at that and think, that is like, patting your head and rubbing your tummy at the same time like it's like doing one thing how do you sing and, and do that at the same time and and that is it, it just has become got to become sort of second nature to you and that's where the mm. practice comes in as well and so yeah i i, I want to i would want to practice my piano playing to a point where i don't need to think about it so yeah i would i would do that and i would try and have a conversation at the same time where i can do that without thinking about it and i can still have a conversation and if i can yeah. do that then, then I can sing along with it as well. Because singing, actually, you know, it's, it's it's easier to sing along to the music than it is to have a conversation over it. Because the singing and the playing are linked, the conversation and the playing aren't. Um, yeah. So yeah. And that's yeah. where practicing along to a metronome, or even practicing yeah. along to a YouTube clip of somebody playing the song that you know we can use you and you know we might do it in a different arrangement somebody's asked the question do you recommend taking ostinatos from worship recordings or making up your own which would be more helpful less distracting for a congregation I, i've done both you know there's some mm -hmm. great yeah. there's some great things out there aren't there but it it is nice to make you know if 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 you have the confidence and the and and have a good idea you know absolutely go with it and um Often we need to play, as I said at the beginning, more simply. Than it is. What we it's see. all about simplicity. It really is. You know, that's just um, three notes repeated. Yeah. You similarly with "Living Hope." You can see, you can hear how similar it is. <laughs> you know, where, where yeah. it's, it's a, the B flat and the F, just up and down. Um, yeah. That's what I do for the song "Living Hope." But yeah. And know. that's good. You know the you don't have to do it the same way every time you play it you know as well no. you know and, and actually there's nice to have variety otherwise it becomes this is the way we do that song you know we've got an arrangement of how great thou art which does like this as an introduction it goes oh lord my god when i in awesome one and actually We've probably overdone that now because that's, yeah. that's kind of how we do that song. It's, it's great, but it's good to have a bit of variety at the same time, yeah. It is nice to have some different things yeah. in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. Um, so that, that's that's rhythm, that's groove, that's all sonato. Um, obviously, we're blasting through, through things really quickly here. I'm going to move on to talking a little bit about chords now. Um, I, I want to say we, we need to know our chords, even if we're a classical pianist who's just used to, re to reading the notes. Um, I want to encourage you to learn how to look at a, a, a piece of music and see the, the chords above the notes rather than the notes themselves because that will free you. Um, all, if, you know, if you see a chord, this is the chord C in the music, all you've got to do is play a C chord until you see the next chord. That gives you so much more time to concentrate on, on maybe the rest of the band or to concentrate on your singing or to concentrate on the congregation um, or you know, as someone said, just look up. You know, if I'm if I'm reading, if I'm sight reading the music, I have to have my eyes glued to the to the music. Um, but if I'm just sort of half looking at the chords because I know where they're going anyway, um, I I can be looking elsewhere. Yeah. So we've got to know our chords. Um, I I often just see a chord on a rhythm chart as well as as a suggestion. You know, I see C major. Let's see me to triad. I, I never really want to play a triad. I'll I'll want to do something different. So you've got you've got the different inversions of C major. You've got different you know, There's C C five quite low down. It can be quite droney. You know. Um, also thinking about adding additional notes to the the C E and G, which make up the C chord. Um, if you think about adding the the second or the ninth, which is the D. 
nonsense, it's got so much more warmth, so much more character. You can't go wrong with the second, so, you know, adding the G into the F chord, adding the, the A into the G chord, all those. give that more depth to the sound. You've also got the, the seventh, yeah, seven, that's really crunchy. Um, you've also got the, the sixth, or the suspended. You know, you've got lots of different ways and, and you won't need to use them all all the time, although I tend to use a ninth pretty much 90% of the time. Um, uh, it's just having these, these additional notes in our arsenal. And we've got to learn how they fit under our hands and how they sound, so that is just natural. Um, so just to slow that down sea. for a second, David, if mm. you're, I'm, I'm just, I'm looking, some some people in the chat maybe maybe feel, actually, that this is how I've done this, this is always how I've played this chord, or whatever, or, you know, other people feel that maybe they're kind of locked in to just playing things in a particular way. So if, rather than just having your simple, your kind of C triad, which is just your C, E, G, and your C in the mm -hmm. bass, even doing something as simple as adding in a, a D into yeah. that just softens it slightly, doesn't it? Line. So yeah. the, the C, D, G, you know, and that's a very simple way of playing that. You might want to add it up, up, there, yeah. up the top. Yeah, different versions. That's just a slightly different approach to playing that particular chord. So when you see the letter C at the top of the page, actually you have permission to add in other notes to make it yeah. work. And you have permission to experiment, you know. Mm. On that, I'd say Sunday morning is probably not the place to do all your experimentation. Uh, it may be some of the place to do it, but you know, just, just feel like you've got an opportunity to play something in a slightly different, mm. richer way. And I think that's what David's talking about with the, the kind of different- Here, Here's something to think about with experimentation. Um, I remember one of my tutors at college always used to say, if you play a wrong note, if you're improvising, making it up, and you play a wrong note, that, that wrong note is only one note away from being a right note. So one note either side. So say I went, you know, I, I could move that one note up, and then it works. Or I could move it down, and then it works. Um, so you, your wrong note, it's, it's only very nearly a wrong note. It's very nearly a right note as well. Um, something to think about. Do just experiment. Um, as I said, learn how the chords fit under your hands. Um, and that will really help. Because it can be quite mind-boggling to see lots of chords on, on, the, on the chart. And you don't want to be thinking, okay, C, F, G, D minor, A minor, C. If, I, if you just get used to going, there's, there's C, there's F. Notice how my, my hand, my right hand hasn't really moved. There is G, there is C, there is the D minor, there is the A minor, it's back to C. All within the same place. So I don't need to move my hand around a lot um, to play all those chords because they can all be fitted into the same place in the piano. Um, so I did this in Crown with Many Crowns earlier on, you know. Crown with many crowns. Different chord, but pretty much the same hand position. The upon his throne, all those chords can all be fitted around the same part of, of the piano, which means you don't need to move around so much, which ultimately just makes your life so much easier. Um, and I personally think it sounds a bit better as well. Some of us might benefit from seeing uh, that written down in front of us. And I think somebody's mm -hmm. already recommended the book uh, Worship Piano by Bob Coughlin. Bob Coughlin leads the Sovereign Grace Music Ministries in the States. Yeah, that, that, that would be a really good place because he does talk quite in detail about chords there. If you actually want to see it on sheet music written out in front of you, what some of those different chords look like, I'd say that would be the place to go. Worship yeah. Piano, Bob Coughlin. And Bob, Bob goes into far more detail than, than I'm going to go into here on chords in, in some of his seminars that he's done, which you can, you can check out online as well. Um, you know, it's, 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 quite a comp, it's quite a big area of music and uh, it's, not, it's not necessarily complex, but there's quite a lot there. Um, and it just takes time to, to go through it, but I would really encourage you to delve into the world of chords and just stop experimenting um, underneath. 
And also just think about, we can simplify chords so often in our songs. Um, generally, I think uh, you can take out all the chords apart from the first in a bar and maybe one other if you need it, if it needs to be a passing chord. Um, this, this might involve a little bit of rewriting, but it, it does make your playing um, so much more simpler. Um, rather than thinking, so for example, before the throw, can't even remember the original chords. <laughs> I, I basically simplified all that and taking out all the chords apart from the one first chord at the beginning of the bar. creates so much more space in the song for the melody to sing and for the congregation to sing. Um, it, it simplifies your playing which makes your life easier you know I, I probably have developed that style of playing because I want to focus more on my singing um, as well um, and it, it, it also has the bad benefit of something a little bit more modern and contemporary um, and as Phil said it's a different version of maybe the way you've done it in your church for the past 20 years. Um, you can also then obviously make chords more complex um, and you can alter chords for musical interest so um, you can do this it should be done really sparingly and make sure it's done tastefully as well um, so it's not a chance to show off your master's level in harmony and counterpoint um, you gotta think does does the way does these chords engage the congregation with the words um, that's really really important um, so it might be a really, really small change. Um, so for example, you might want to use the relative minor of a chord. So major, the relative minor is, is uh, three semitones down. There's the relative minor, which is A minor. Very, very related chords. But, but using the relative minor instead of the major can just alter how it feels. Um, so, Sovereign Grace did it on O Lord My God, My Redeemer for the, the start of the third verse. Where they, instead of the D, they used to be a minor. Oh, 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 oh. the relative minors that, that gives us that little bit more variety and you can also then obviously go um, far more complex you know going back to crowning with many crowns last verse I tend to, to have gone off on a little bit of a piece uh, in terms of creating some chords which sit underneath it's always got to sit underneath the 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 melody um, <laughs> sort of crunchy but it, it, it sort of highlights oh, we're now at the last verse this is exciting what chord um, is that what chord is that tell us what chord an, that is an f sharp major chord over an e in the bass oh yeah um, should we should win the play no but your, your melody notes there and then there's your f sharp again which then results to the b interesting here so the A goes down to a C sharp major I'm in the key of E by the way and then the F sharp goes down to a D sharp major chord Obviously, that takes quite a quite a bit of musical knowledge, but you may you may be there in your musical journey to begin to explore how some of these chords can be used. And there's lots of places online where you can find arrangements which you might get some inspiration from. If um, if you wrote that down, David, I would buy it. <laughs> it's, it's here somewhere. That's my. It feels like it feels like Christmas. It feels like the last, the last verse, the death camp verse of uh, Oh Come well, On You and, and we all we all know the effect special, that those it? verses have. They, they do. They signal. To, and quite often, the last verse of these big hymns are the verses which point us towards heaven, yeah. and and show us the glory which is to come. And and it, it, it if it's done well, 
the chords that we use underneath can really highlight that. The congregation probably won't always know what you're doing. They might recognise something's changed here, but it just gives the music that little bit of impetus at the end that yeah. maybe is needed. And so we, I know we've, we've kind of been simple, 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 prioritise being simple, but prioritising doesn't being simple doesn't mean we can't be special and yeah. have spe- but you can't you, you wouldn't do that every time you play that at him you know it, it's 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 no. there can be special moments you might say oh this is a, a significant service and mm. yeah a, a critique and a genuine critique could be is the heart behind that wanting to be more showy offy or whatever and you know you can you can assess your heart with that but I, actually i think we can genuinely in a humble godly way do something which is more special and and that's okay Mm. and and it can be different next week and And obviously it depends on the 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 level of musicians that you've got you know um if your guitar players are are going to really struggle with all those chords then it might just be more loving to not do them um you know uh it's 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 just a wisdom call but yeah you're getting Um, lots of comments david somebody says that was (laughs) harmonically so satisfying to listen to (laughs) Sarah, Sarah is thanks, a big Sarah. Sarah fan. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Sarah. I don't know who you are, but thank you. Um, oh, Phil, I'm really wary of time, but I'm just going to blast through a few final you things. I'll so, fucking drop, didn't you? So, pedal. Pedal is our best friend as pianists. It's also our worst enemy. Um, uh, pedaling, it, it should be linked with our rhythm, with our groove, with the chords that we're playing. Generally, you want to change the pedal whenever you change the chord. Um, uh, that's the general rule. Um, a couple of things to remember though, overpedaling will just create a mushy, unclear sound that will be really, really hard to sing along to. Um, if I haven't changed the pedal there, it still doesn't sound nice. And the more you add chords, obviously, the more mushy it gets. And I think if, you, if you've got the tendency to overpedal, um, the problem may be that actually you're not lifting your foot high enough. So I don't know if you can see here in my piano that whenever I put the pedal up and down, you can see the, the, the dampers moving in there. Um, so if I, I might move my foot, but if I haven't moved my foot enough, the dampers won't dampen the strings to have a clean sound for the next time. So it might be just that you need to think about lifting your foot that bit more. But at the same time, we don't want to. We want to avoid the the the, the time which where we cause so uh, like a bit of a gap in the sound. And then it becomes clunky. So, pedaling is is um is something to think about. Um, if if it's something that you struggle with, record yourself. Maybe even you know find find somebody who can help you. Just think how to coordinate the pedaling, um, because it can really serve us well. Um, uh, pitch as well uh, we were talking uh, earlier about uh, making sure that we're not in the way of the other musicians we have an instrument here which can literally get in the way of every other single instrument in the world because we've got the lowest note and the highest note and, and we can uh, you know puke all over anybody else's playing with any any aspect of our pitching so we've got to be really careful about where we're pitching our playing um, so know where the other instruments lie, so your guitar generally lies around here, sort of around the middle, um, your bass guitar obviously down here, you might have some instruments like flute, uh, violin, which tend to be a bit higher, um, so if you're playing along with these sort of instruments, it's good to know where on your keyboard they sit, and the most important thing to remember is where the congregation sits, which is generally just below middle C, and about an octave, just over an octave above that. And we want to make sure that we're always below the congregation. So I would say that if you're accompanying our congregation with just the piano, you'll want to be in the bottom half pretty much the whole time. Uh, 90% of the time you're down here. Because this is giving you the depth of the sound. Yeah? Um, uh, some of us, I think, maybe could do with learning how to, to, to bring in our bass notes a bit more. Um, to give that depth of playing with the octaves. Obviously we don't want to play too busy down here because that gets really muddy. Um, uh, But that's something that we we might want to think about. Um, But also always just thinking sparingly. 
Um, if you do want to uh, provide something up near the top half of the piano, uh, you might just want to think, is it out of the way of everything else? Um, so, living hope, how great the chasm that lay between us. Da, 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 da. simple which is just filling that space and that does lead us on to the to the fills which um someone has asked a question about already um uh, some of us uh like me tend to overfill too much i am worst uh culprit of that um but what i'm trying to do is listen to the space that is being created the musical space which is being created by the whole band and I always ask myself the question, is this the moment where I, I can add something with a fill or is it just going to get in the way of someone else or is it going to potentially distract the congregation? Um, so fills, are, they're not an opportunity to show off, you know. Uh, I heard this once, it really made me laugh. God, God never looks down on our fills and goes, oh, wow, did you see that? That was amazing. You know, it doesn't happen. Um, so it's not our place to show off. Um, the purpose of the fill should be to signal to the congregation that we're maybe going somewhere different, potentially into, into a chorus, um, uh, you know, helping them know when they're supposed to sing. That should be the purpose of the fill. The fact that it adds musical interest is a bonus. Um, so, uh, I, I don't know, um, just going back to the video. Jesus Christ, my name. That little fill shows us that we're going to somewhere different. And once you've done the fill, don't keep filling. You know, when Hallelujah. We don't want any of that. You know, once you've done the fill in this moment, just revert back to playing something nice and simple. Um, uh, yeah. I, I'm sort of running out of things to say now. I think it's interesting. Um, Somebody's asked a really good question just now, which mm. is actually, do you ever play the tune when you're playing the piano out of the congregation? So uh, at the start, I said melody, rhythm, harmony. And I was going to focus on harmony and uh, rhythm because I think generally I never play the melody um, if there's melody elsewhere. Um, so, for example, the congregation are singing the melody. I don't want to yeah. be playing the melody at the same time, generally. But just because of the way the piano works, the piano, you can see the hammers, they hit a string and it creates a dung, yeah? Um, yeah. Whereas when we sing, we don't do a dung, it grows, ha, ah, yeah? So the, the two things are very, very different. And if you're playing the melody along with the congregation, I think it just jars. Um, playing Patricia the playing... has actually, yeah, sh sorry, David. She's just followed up the question with, I think this is a really valid point, actually. Some members of the congregation, some maybe with hearing problems, comment that they appreciate the tune being clear in the piano as well as being sung, and singers can benefit too. It, it's, it's a really interesting point. And actually, you know, our highest calling is to serve the people that God's placed in front of us. And you know, yeah. if you've got a church with a number of people with hearing difficulties, they might mm -hmm. find actually if the if the if the melody is confidently sung, that may be sufficient. Or you could even have a, a melody instrument, a violin or a flute or yeah. something, you know, yeah. doubling that. Mm -hmm. I guess from a musical point of view, it can just become quite samey if that's the way that every song is played yeah. on the piano. Whereas actually, the the the, the melody is already being done. The voice is carrying yeah. that, you know. Yeah. So and we, we can always use way. melody in our in our introductions as well. Um, so we've got that melody there. And whenever we do play melody, we want to make it really clear. But then, yeah. oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer, the melody is then taken over, hopefully with um, confident singing. Um, you know, see with praise my soul, the King of Heaven, who is fit thy tribute bring. Um, I'm not praise my soul, the King of Heaven. I don't. I, 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 there may 
may be space for it sometimes. Um, yeah. Potentially, if you're teaching a new song or whatnot. But I, I wanna, I wanna try and avoid that as much as possible. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, yeah, I think that's that's really really helpful. Definitely. Yeah. Thanks, David. That's great. Uh, we're going to spend just a, a few minutes thinking about um, leading, actually leading the band from the piano. I'll give David a little rest for a minute. David, wave at me if you want to say something. Uh, actually, it's been it's just been so that's been so helpful, hasn't it? Practically thinking it through some of those piano techniques and and uh, and all of that. How wonderful um, to, to get all those tips. Thank you so much. And thanks for the chat. They're still coming through. I, I hope that you've picked up, actually, it, it, it's a more important for us as musicians, as pianists in a church, to be able to smile as we play rather than sweating because what we're doing is too difficult and too tricky. And uh, so I, I want to give you full permission just to relax. If you're able to, and some of us will be, will feel quite nervous as we play. Some of us will feel very relaxed. And, and, and maybe we actually need to dip back into some of these things that David's been saying. I'm really thankful that we've got access to this seminar for, I think it's a month or so. So, you know, you could go back next week and say, oh, I want to listen to that thing about chord voicing. Or I want to listen to that thing about riffs and ostinato and i'm gonna uh, what we're kind of offering you in this time is here is a toolkit um we don't use all of the tools every time but pick one or two that you might might want to take and, and put into practice this next sunday in terms of leading uh, from the piano uh that's really talking about maybe you're in a position where you sing and you play and you kind of lead uh from 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 the piano in that way that's generally what i do um uh, David talked a bit about posture, about kind of sitting, and some of us sit, some of us stand. I think that's probably worth just just saying. I, I like to stand when I'm leading and playing the piano, I mean, for a few reasons. It feels slightly awkward, actually, kind of saying to the congregation, let's stand and sing the next song. I'll, I'll sit, but, uh, you know, it, it can feel slightly awkward doing that, you know, and that's fine. There is some, I, I think I, I sing more confidently when I stand. Uh, I think it, it just, just helps me. It's a personal preference. There's no right or wrong answer. Some of us will feel that's completely alien and and and, and difficult for us. Uh, so, you know, just do what you feel most comfortable doing. Uh, one of the biggest compliments I think I ever got as like a young musician, 15 year old or something like that, was, uh, was that actually when I played, I'm predictable. And that's it, that's interesting, isn't it? It's not it's not always deemed to be uh, a compliment, and I think at the time it took me a while to realise that was a compliment. But rather than predictable, probably a better word is followable, easy to follow. And so as as we play, as we think about some of these things that David's been talking about, when we do an introduction of a song, it's got to be one of the jobs we we want to do is to make it glitteringly obvious when we're going to sing okay so before the throne before the throne of god above and one of the ways we do that is is kind of doing the same thing in between each verses so doing an introduction and then using that same that's just a d d7 g and then you can use sometimes we use like what i call like a little hinge chord I'm going to bring David back in because he will know the, the technical term for that. So if I do like a G over A, that's a kind of, it's just yeah. a lift, isn't it? It, it? it sort of acts as a suspension and suspensions yeah. naturally want to be resolved. So if you're suspending something, you yeah. you know, you want to resolve that to there. And that, that signals that, that we're maybe starting something before the throne of... Yeah. Yeah. And you may not want to do that every time you're leading. And, and some of us might think, oh, that's a little bit twee, possibly, to do something like that. But it, what one thing it certainly is, it's obvious. It's obvious we're now going to go into sing. That's particularly important, I think, if you are a pianist who leads the singing, if you like, but doesn't sing yourself. Um, if you're in that situation, I, I would actually encourage you, even if you don't feel like you've got the strongest voice in the world, there is something more helpful about singing as you play as the lead musician um, because it, it is an obvious cue to the congregation um, where to sing and, and how to lead. You might have other singers with you. Even if it's not into your microphone as well. Exactly. You know. Yeah, yeah, that's really, really Just important. Just the visible aspect of, of singing is, is yeah. so helpful. My friend um, Ben Sleep, Ben's leading the guitar seminar today. Uh, he's got this great uh, little kind of acronym which spells out Ben S. It's a little bit, you know, 
self-indulgent i'd say but uh ban s uh if you if you've heard me speak about this before apologies about repeating myself but um b for for ben ben st- b stands for breathe you know if you physically take a breath in if you give eye contact to the congregation e that's so breathe is b eye contact is e nod is n you know a little just a little gesture it could be a nod of the head or a little lift of the head something that is visually engaging the people in front of you that something is about to happen you know a little bit like that chord does and the other thing the other tool that we've got in our toolkit and this is a really important tool is to smile and if you smile you're communicating to the congregation it's okay we can relax we know where we're going we're in this together and you you do so so breathe eye contact nod smile that's another way you know if you're doing the it's difficult to do all those things at the same time remember before the throne you know it's just a little visual cue um i actually at the beginning of lockdown i started to record some videos of um of me just playing simple hymns for churches to use uh if if you're a church to use them and find them helpful praise god uh and uh and one of the things, my wife and I were having a conversation, you know, I could just stick the lyrics up on the lyric video and just make it obvious that, you know, this is this is what we're doing. Uh, but her eyes, she said, actually, it's really important that they see you um, playing as you lead because there, there is something confidence in, in boosting about seeing someone actually give a visual cue as you play. So maybe that, remember that. If you remember nothing else about the leading aspect, remember Ben S. Uh, breathe, eye contact, nod, smile. That's really, really helpful. Uh, a little reminder for us all. It's important to think about what you, you... So you can lead when you're actually physically playing up the front of church. You can also lead others in music when you are in the congregation. So we're willing on the day, aren't we, when we're able to sing again as a congregation. And we can't wait for that day. And Lord, we pray that that will come soon. But when you're there, you know, remember to model and lead by example how to sing in your congregation you know if you're a pastor a minister or a leader in any way you've got to set an example to the church to the to the next generation to your children in passionate singing it's amazing how much that that works in in a group it's amazing how much that's helpful we've talked a lot about kind of simplicity kind of getting out of the way and uh, we've got to remember that it's it's the voice, the voices of the congregation that is the the main event when it comes to the singing of of God's people. You know what we are doing is is um, is backing up and supporting that. So if we sing when we play, we kind of reinforce that. Uh, it's it's about thinking about what we need to play, not what we can play. Um, and uh, I think a helpful point, you know, arrange the instrument instrumentation of your band of how you're playing in a way not to overpower but to facilitate the congregation's voice you know it's not you know in some churches of old it could feel like maybe it was the organ versus the singing in the church you know who can be louder who can do do it better and you know it's never it's not a competition but but try and do what you can to to facilitate that the voice sits on top the, the voice sit on top almost like the icing on the cake and we've got to make sure that they kind of have their place and, and are able to do that. It's, do that it's well. always worth reminding everybody that no matter what you do in an introduction, hopefully your introduction is clear and um, helpful to start singing, but no matter what, everything probably needs to take about three steps yeah. back once the congregation starts to sing. Yeah, um, that's it. You know. And especially if it's a song that people know really well. So like... found you don't need to do much there he is my light my strength my song but then it, it's also worth thinking about the the kind of shape and the musical journey that you're going on as david's talked about before you know so within that song you know in the second verse you might want to take it up a level and be a little bit more in the in the bottom half of the piano kind of reinforcing those chord changes but not feeling that you necessarily have to do all the chords all the time, you know, having full permission to do that. And then in the third verse, the kind of resurrection point, that is the point where you might want to fit, you know, there in the ground. I'm going to use a pedal. His body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then 
bursting forth in a glorious day. Add in some chords, maybe up from the grave he rose again. And that's the moment, maybe you know you want to soar. And as he stands, you know, yeah, that is you, you can't have moments where it's okay to kind of take off. And you know, I'm often saying this to instrument it, uh people instrumentalists who play along with me you know it's lovely when you hear an instrument soar be that a violin or a flute or something in an appropriate moment it does really lift you uh it's like that that chord arrangement that david used earlier on there's something about the way that we play and the shape of a song that can really add to what the song is saying you know when we sing it's 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 musical theology you've got to remember you know the songs that we sing we learn our theology through what we sing we, we we people will go away from your church service humming and singing the words of the songs far more sorry preachers than what the preacher has said you know it, it's true i'm a preacher i, I can say that to myself um uh, we've got to remember that that we're putting words we're putting truth onto people's lips and so what what is the most important the high point of a song you know mm. the cross and the resurrection is that is revealed you know there's all often those moments and I, I would say that every song only has one high point as well yes um you know I, I remember at college i might have been playing a whole half hour piece of music my teachers would have always said where is your loudest moment it's only one moment in the whole yeah. half hour's worth of music we might have songs that are four or five minutes long there's only one high point and and where where is that going to sit you know it's probably going to come in the latter quarter um uh, but how are we going to get there and then maybe, uh, you also need to think about how you're going to come away from it as well um so that your songs as phil says has this arc and you may you may you know modulate a little bit but um still over overarching flow to the whole song it's really really important yeah and we, we can get stuck in the rut and we can kind of do the th- same things the same way you know you kind of have so how great thou art you know you have your, your kind of creation verse uh, and then you might go in the third verse and when i think that god mm-hmm. his son not sparing sent him to die and you can go to the relative minor i scarce can take it in that on the cross you know and and so what what is the piano doing in that thing well it's just supporting and it's it's you know it is filling the gaps um but it, it's not just doing that there it, it's kind of underlying uh what's going on it's it might be worth at this point just saying a little bit about other other sounds that that your piano has uh, and can do this is this is a nord you know i say i praise the lord for the nord i'm very thankful <laughs> for this busy kit in front of me um that this is a nord stage this kind of fits into three categories you can have your piano section your organ section you know so if you want to kind of go for your your hammonds and and they have the place and it can be it can be hard to do that subtly and do that well but just playing the piano that's one thing I, i'll sometimes put a little kind of pad underneath don't know if you can hear that and that just again adds a little bit of richness um i tend to find subtlety with these things is 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 our best friend you know not mm. to overcook it not to overdo it with the kind of gadgets and gizmos and having a little bit of uh, of a pad underneath is is often helpful especially in a kind of slightly slower song so um uh, uh i don't know what, what we could do so oh lord our rock and our redeemer lord our rock and our redeemer i've forgotten how to play that one but it's uh uh you know those those kind of songs where you kind of have a little bit more space yeah. uh sometimes it's good it is it is also gaps. worth worth saying that actually an acoustic piano is is very different to the yes. Nord. Um, so i i play i play an Nord also over in church um but the piano the acoustic piano if you're playing on an acoustic piano it's got all the nuances and overtones that each and every one of the strings inside here creates and generally you 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 want to play far less because this will create so much more noise and and especially potentially unpleasant noise the 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 notes in that note are so finely tuned and perfected that you get away with with that bit more so i just want to say be careful especially if you're playing uh, a real piano um, yeah and i think it's great that you're playing a real piano because um i don't want to see them die out <laughs> i die far prefer yeah i far, far yeah. prefer the real piano it's just a lot harder to get it right 
we're not endorsed by Nord. We're not telling you to go out and buy a Nord. There, there's a, you do see a lot of these around. They're, they're a really nice piece of kit and they do they are expensive, uh, but there are other keyboards which are at a bit different price point, which you can do also do a great job. Um, so mm. don't don't feel, you know, I brought this home and my wife was like, oh, it's very red. That was her first reaction. <laughs> it's not, is it going to react? Is it going to match the wallpaper? Unfortunately, <laughs> only common red. But <laughs> only common red, sadly, but that's, uh, you know, it's okay. They're quite nice. Um, yeah. Somebody's asked, what's the place of organ in contemporary music? I think it can have a place, you know. It's another kind of padding sound, especially if you are not the lead uh, musician as a keyboard player in the band and you just do some texture in the back, you know, thinking about mm. organs, maybe even some s- nice string sounds and, and, yeah. and things like that. It, so that, that it, last verse yeah. of Chronic with Many Crowns, I, we yeah. did a recording of that for Easter. Um, it's on YouTube, you can check it out, but I, I, I added an organ sound in quite a lot to it. I and mean, the last verse, it just, yeah, lifts it. As you said, it's got that big fullness um, and yeah. depth and, and yeah. In terms of current sound, like organ is actually quite in at the minute, you know, as a kind of sound, you know, it's, it's not, it's, you know, like more of an electronic organ sound. So it, it, it doesn't feel as dated as maybe it, it sometimes would. Strings actually, in, in terms of it, like electronic strings, can sometimes feel a bit more dated. But, you know, it depends how it's done and it can be done tastefully or it can be done less tastefully. And that, that is one of the challenges. I'm really conscious of time. I wanted to leave five minutes at the end just for folks to ask any questions. I've got one more thing to say, but I'd love to uh, to hear any final questions or comments or things that people want. You can put it in the chat or you can ask a question at the bottom, specifically in the um, ask a question section in the chat. Uh, whatever would be, I know we've we've had a fair bit of, of to and fro as we've been going through, so that there might not be too much more, but we'll just give you a couple of seconds um, to type anything in. Uh, if there's anything else, uh, do feel free. I'd say this, I guess, say on behalf of David, get in touch with us, you know, on social media or whatever. You'd be more than welcome to message us with a question or a comment. Um, we, we're very happy. You can find me on, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or wherever things are, are at. And uh, I'm sure you can find David too. Uh, or send us an email via, via our church um, uh, website. That would also be a, a way to do it. Um, yeah, somebody said here, coming from Northern Ireland, now living in Wales. Oh, great. Rosie, a fellow Northern Irish person. Lovely. You're you're in fine company. Very little beats the organ with the traditional amazing Welsh hymns and a full-throated harmonising Welsh congregation. Absolutely. Amen. I love that. You know, a little glimpse of heaven, isn't it? When you hear people, you know, in, in four part harmony with an organ, it's it's just wonderful. Uh, and as and a, as you know, different... we've we've talked we talked this whole time about playing the piano, and and actually, it's really refreshing sometimes if if you're blessed to have an organ in your church, which is hardly ever used. You know, take the last hymn, make make it a hymn, and go and play the organ, and yeah, um, you you'll be maybe you might be surprised about how many people actually appreciate it. Um, and yeah. it's it's great yeah somebody said here any tips on playing but then speaking to read a psalm or to pray i said that's something i do quite regularly um uh yeah that, that's somewhere something that that actually some of these kind of uh pad signs can come you know if you if you wanted just to leave a chord hanging and then you could say a prayer or read a psalm uh, before you go into the next thing that that's something that you can definitely do and um, don't feel under any pressure to kind of keep going you know lord i just want to thank you for this time together and you know yeah although you can't do that but it's, it's it gets a little it gets a little bit like intense after <laughs> you know and, yeah, and that's I, right. it, it, it's a lot harder as, as we've talked it's it's hard to talk and play at the same time so you do you just want to play something really simple let it ring and, yeah. and speak and and actually if you've got somebody else in the band like a guitarist who could do that yeah you know ask them to do that as well you know yeah. somebody said would you ever mix organ with other instruments in a church context yeah why not you know if yeah. it's in tune and it it you know if the band could tune to it or you know whatever yeah. would, to make it work i would just be very wary of of where do you want the main sound to be so i would yeah. i would encourage that actually if you've got a band with the organ the band wants to be the main sound and the organ wants to be um complementing that so yeah. it may be that the organ only plays for the first and last verse to lift it uh or, or things like this just just being very careful about where the sound is is you know primarily being created from yeah absolutely 
Uh, uh, Anna, thanks for your question. You said, as a band leader, how do you manage different levels of confidence with band members as well as liaising with tech and service team leader alongside all the other musical stuff? I, I'd say just remember that you're all on the same team. I think that's quite important sometimes. Sometimes we can be, I expect we're quite a large church here in Nottingham, uh, Cornerstone, and you, you can sometimes feel like you've got your PA team, you've got your tech team, you've got your musicians, you've got your service leader, you've got your preacher. And, and, and actually we're all in the same team. So where possible spending time together as a team, even socially, something that we've tried to do is, you know, and when we've been allowed to do it, having a barbecue or having a uh, having some social time together as musicians. Actually, when we spend time together, not on the pitch, if you like, <laughs> to use a sporting analogy, then your your relationships are are deepened by that, and you tend to find that you can you can kind of play well better together. I think encouraging people as well, you know, where they're at. Uh, I'm, I'm a youth worker as well as a musician, so I've got a real heart for raising up younger musicians and giving people a go and giving, ha- having, having, um, yeah, just encouraging people to, to, to try things out, but also recognizing that, that, that God has not called everyone in our church to be a musician. And, you know, so it, it might not be that everyone who, who, who can play a musical instrument is, is going to be on the music team and just having some caution with that. As well, anything else, David, from you on that one? Um, no, I think uh, someone once told me once, uh, you know, with regards to your sound guy, um, you just want to you know, make sure you've got a good friendship there, you know, even yeah. just a good relationship because it can get very tense just 10 minutes before the service and everything goes to pot. And, and you want to make sure that actually this is still a, a church family member that you know and you love rather than, you know, Joe Vlogs off the street who um, you don't care about. It, it, you know, yeah. developing those relationships, I would really encourage us That's all it. to do. Somebody has just asked me to do something quickly. Could you turn around your cushion the right way? I thought it was just back <laughs> to front because of the camera. Is it now right? That's yeah, not right, yeah. It does actually say home on it. There we go. Yeah, We're we can home. read that now. You can see that. Thank you yeah. for that very helpful. <laughs> Sorry if that's been frustrating you and... Mickey, you I'm also I'm also enjoying the fact that we've both got virtually the same plants in the background. We do, you know? we do. You know, we're not in the same room. It's not like I'm over there. I can't reach into your picture. Yeah. <laughs> I did. I did see a picture of Phil's setup from his angle just just before, and it's nowhere near as tidy as what we're seeing on the screen right now. Which is quite funny. That is true. Sorry to expose that, Phil. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. It's on Twitter. You can see that. Yeah, that's it. It's all about <laughs> yeah, not giving the perception of it being slick. There's nothing to slick about this no, no. folks thank you so much for your uh time to uh t- with us we've had a, a good time together and uh, absolutely do feel free to get in touch we'd love to hear from you i just want to finish by saying you know every time we gather together as a church what is our expectation of that every time we lead people in song what is our expectation of that well we should pray for and expect god's spirit to work in people's hearts in our hearts in the hearts of our congregation you know, it can be very easy to think that, you know, uh, God's spirit is at work in churches where things look very slick and very fancy. In a church which has got 500 people, more than a church where it's got 50 people. Um, but, you know, we can be confident that where Christians gather to sing, pray, hear God's word, to celebrate the gospel, God's spirit is there and it'll do, uh, he will do only what he can do, bring conviction comfort um giving hope to the hopeless satisfying people who are spiritually hungry and and he loves to work through ordinary dependent people like you and me and so uh if you're here today and you're weary in what you're doing if you feel a bit burned out if you feel like those issues that we talked about at the start of people skill of um, of, of various other sort of things of encouragement uh of expectation and engagement are low just keep going. You know, I love the little story um, very quickly. Martin Lloyd-Jones, great preacher in London. Um, uh, and uh, somebody went and, and asked the question, what, what, what does Martin Lloyd-Jones say to people on the way out of church? What is it that he does, you know, on the door? You know, I wonder what he's, this great man says to people on the way out of church. 
And so he went uh, one day to the church and, and stood beside the church door. And every person who came out through the church door, maybe shook their hands, you know, when you're allowed to do that. It's amazing to think you could do that. Uh, would you shake the hands of the person on the way out the door? What did Martin Lloyd Jones said to them? Keep on. Keep going. Keep on. And I love that. If there's any encouragement for any of us today, keep going, keep on, and uh, do what you're doing. Serve God in your local church and, 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 and thank him for the gifts that he's given to you and to your church and that he's given us to our churches to be used for his glory. Thanks so much for joining us today, folks. Uh, God bless thank you. Thank you, yeah. And uh, from David and from myself. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, you take care. God bless. Bye-bye.